Can we take a step back and maybe in the early 2000s, for example, when you just joined Ireland in the UK? 2000, yeah, 2001, yeah. And, and you, you signed artists like Amy Winehouse. What exactly is the process of scouting that talent and, and dealing with the artist? Well, back in 2001, you know, uh, it was still largely down to, uh, you know, as, a, as an A&R person, as an A&R team, you have a network of relationships uh, for managers, lawyers, uh, agents and promoters. And that network would largely be feeding stuff to you. Uh, and it's about keeping her ear to the ground. So in, in Amy Winehouse's case, actually, she was repped by 19s, which was Simon Fuller's company. And Simon Fuller was a real rainmaker, a very successful manager. Although Simon wasn't really day-to-day -day involved with it, it was a guy called Nick Shemansky. Um, and um, he came to our attention and uh, we were blown away by her. But it's a you know, interesting thing is, and trust me, I, I have plenty of mistakes as much as good ones as well. But, you know, that's the great thing about music is, you know, one man's meat is another man's poison. You know, Amy Winehouse wasn't adopted wide. It's like everybody had to have her. Some people thought she's a marginal jazz singer. We just happened to be passionate about her. Um, but the process was, we heard music, we loved the music. We put her in the studio to record some more music to demo her. You know, we then had several meetings with her and, you know, enough to convince us that we want to invest in, in her. But the interest, I mean, this is actually quite an interesting question because the deal when we actually did it with Amy was, was at the time, was a relatively lucrative deal. It was not, not a bargain. Um, whereas, you know, I can tell you that Blur, uh, who at the time was known as Seymour, was signed on two singles. It was probably about £3,000. Um, and, and history will tell you that the biggest artists, the biggest breakout artists, are invariably not the ones that create the biggest signing buzz. So Ed Sheeran was dropped by many companies and passed on by most companies at some point in his career. Um, but, you know, the public will, uh, will tell you otherwise. Um, you know, I, but at the same time, I mean, you know, we'd have scouts out on the roads, literally driving up and down the country checking out clubs, checking out, you know, going to colleges, just checking out what local talent. And, um, you know, there was a constant flow of what we call unsolicited music, music that just coming through the door. Uh, music submitted through known contents, managers, lawyers, um, you know, people, people who'd had a relationship with business before. Um, and, you know, I always estimated that Around that time, I think we were probably looking at three to four thousand submissions a year. Um, and interestingly enough, I've never signed anything that's come through on an unsolicited recording. If someone just says that, it's never been signed. I mean, now that obviously there has been a real shift towards data. Now data exists, and, uh, which is you know, which is useful. So you know, it's far less about schlepping up and down the, the motorway checking out gigs. It's much more about looking at data, looking at obviously social media stats, looking at early streaming and looking at sort of the, you know, the, the, the connection between an audience and an artist. And that's a really useful tool, but you have to use it in context with lots of other things. You know, artists that, you know, the outliers of the world, and Amy Winehouse was an outlier, would not necessarily test very well from a data point of view because data kind of, for a lot of consumers or you know, people tend to react to stuff they feel familiar with. They don't react very well initially to stuff they're unfamiliar with, but the unfamiliar tends to be, you know, the ground baking, the interesting, the ones that really create new trends. So I always look at data being, it's a very useful tool. It's not the only tool. You still have to look at, you know, that unknown factor, which is uh, star quality or charisma or someone who's just doing something which is, really fresh and unique and you know i suppose you know far be it to think that we are all sort of steve jobs is in the way of making but you know sometimes you build it and they will come you know data won't give you all the answers and i actually think funny enough i do think there is a and this may be uh, this may just be unique to me but i do think there's a kind of there is a little fundamental problem now with certain of a and r where it becomes over data led and where you will get these you know, data will pop up songs like Old Town Road, like the Little Nas X, which it did. It will pop up tracks like Rock Sand by Arizona Service. And 
they create enormous bidding wars. Um, but it doesn't break a career. You know, these will prove to be one-off anomalies. And yeah, they pay the bills to a degree, but you know, I think the job the job of a certainly of an A&R person and the job of a record company, I believe, is a it's a business, so it's to you know, generate profit, but it's also to grow the catalogue, and you grow catalogue by finding. It's an old music business phrase coined by a guy called Armin Erzgen, who's arguably the godfather of the modern music business, which is, you know, you find a genius and you hang on, and a lot of that is is actually true, unfortunately. Geniuses are very few and far between. So, so in between geniuses, you use data. <laughs> Do you think the record labels have an advantage in finding geniuses? Yeah, I do. I mean, I do because because it's just of the network effect. And I mean, this is where I'll talk about sort of this, the, the the kind of dark arts of A and R. Um, is that you know it's amazing. I was thinking with A and R, and I'm always very very defensive about the A and R skill set because. A lot of it's even people within companies themselves are not quite sure what A and R executives do, um, and um, you know it's a it's a high risk job in the sense is you know you, 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 three strikes you're definitely out. You know you need to have to prove your worth, um, but there is something where you have to have an instinct for it. You have to have a feel for it. You have to have a feel for someone who walks in the room. You go, okay, why would I want to invest in that particular person? And a lot of people will go, I have this conversation probably on a weekly basis, go, oh yeah, I could be an A&R guy. I mean, I heard that song on the radio and I knew that was a smash. And I go, okay, hear that song when it's played to you on a piano or a guitar and it's on a really crappy demo. That, that's the thing. And when you know that somebody, you can take it beyond that, that current level. Um, an A&R is a, a great A&R person, is someone who can really see the diamond in the rough and kind of knows what to do with that and understands it as a process and then has to guide that diamond in the rough and polish it and take it through the company um, and support the artist. Um, invariably, the a and relationship and the artist relationship tends to, if the artist is very successful on their debut record, that relationship starts to disappear because the artist goes, I don't really need you anymore. Um, but when you sign an act, the a and r is the you know your your kind of you know your anchor you're basically the rock you hold on to within the record company 